Hey, Rebel Bankers, this is your host, Chris Noggle, and welcome to the show. I have an extra special one for you today. Joining us is the Real Estate Dingo. I'm going to let you tell more about that because that name is just amazing. But we're going to be talking a little bit about how he got started, his journey, some of the obstacles he had to overcome with his first few deals and, and where he's at today, which right now, wait till you hear this, he is a rock star. And uh, I wish you could see him because he's, he's just straight up stud, but unfortunately we couldn't get the camera to work, so we're just going to roll with it. But I know a lot of you are just starting your journey to becoming a Rebel Banker. And I know that journey can sometimes be tough and money is always one of those things that's standing in your way. But you always have to take the leap. You have to get started somewhere. So the best place to get started is grab a copy of the book, The Private Money Guide, and that'll show you the different sources of money, where to go and how to ask. Check us out online at chrisnoggle.com and you can check out all the other events we've got going on. But I'm more excited to jump right into this. So real estate dingo, you're with us. Tell us a little bit about where you're at today, about yourself, and uh, let's roll this thing. Chris, how are you, buddy? Thanks That's for having great. me. Man. Hey, you know, I was actually just bullshitting. The camera's working. I just don't want people to see me without my clothes on. Um, <laughs> because I, I kind of get hot and steamy when I do these things. I get all passionate and excited and I start screaming and yelling and spitting. So um, I think it's, it's best that the camera's off for now. But hey, yeah, mate, look, thanks for the intro. Um, wow, a little bit about me. So, you know, I guess quit school when I was 14. So I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Um, I've got no formal education whatsoever. Um, played professional soccer when I was 18. I would say that, you know, that's probably still to this day my, um, my biggest achievement. And um, I, I kind of caught the real estate bug um, when I stopped playing soccer and I didn't want to work as a laborer in dirty construction sites, you know, getting used and abused by everyone and not really making a lot of money. So I was like, there's got to be something bigger and better out there where I can actually make my money work for me instead of me working for it, right? Had a little bit of background in construction, you know, as I mentioned, working as a laborer. And um, yeah, mate, just started buying real estate. Initially started uh, my journey in Australia built a very large portfolio in a short amount of time. I realized that investing based on hope is not a good strategy because, you know, you should be basing your investment decisions on the fundamentals of a particular transaction, not hope that it's going to go up in value. Um, so, you know, quickly woke up and smelt the roses and decided to kind of sell out of my portfolio in Australia just because I was, I was losing more money on my monthly mortgage repayments than the cash flow. So that was stupid, right? And um, yeah, mate, the US real estate market came across my radar. This was around 2011. You know, prices were rock bottom here and it truly was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to give it a crack. Packed my shit up, dude. Moved into the unknown. Um, and I've been here for around six years now. Fast forward to this day, I've bought, renovated and sold over 500 real estate deals. I made millions doing it. I run various companies. I've got a property management company. I've got a brokerage. I've got a real estate investment company. I've got a nonprofit um, business also. Well, it's actually not a business. We, we give houses away to people in need for free. Not selling any raffle tickets here, Chris. It's, it's from the heart, right? We literally give the bloody thing away. So yeah, man, look, I'm pumped. Happy, happy to be where I am today and I'm happy to be on your show. So that's a oh, quick that's intro. That's fantastic. And, I, and I'm glad we're keeping this PG because, you know, I haven't yet launched the X-rated version of the Real Estate Money School, but you know what? We'll get there. And when we do end up launching that, that X-rated version, I'll make sure to have you back on and we'll actually have the video working for that one. Sound good? It sounds good. And I'm sure you can just beep all of my profanities out. Ah, uh, yeah, we won't even bother. We'll just go with it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a, that's an awesome story. So I, I got one question, uh, pro athlete to pro athlete. I was a pro snowboarder, pro soccer player. Like what was that defining moment back when you were actually, you know, trying to figure out, okay, am I going to stick with the school thing and the traditional mindset and just the conventional wisdom and learning, or am I just going to take that leap and go for this? Like, what was that defining moment where you did that? As in kind of start my, start my real estate investment journey. No, no, actually before that, the soccer, sorry, I'm, I'm way oh. off topic, but you know, you're a pro oh. soccer player and you're the first pro athlete I've had on the show. So yeah. I'm just going pro athlete to pro athlete. Like what was that defining moment I, when you I were get 14? You. Yeah. yeah. So, so pretty much mate, you know, I guess the reason why I decided to hang up the boots and, and, and change my path was because I didn't feel that 
I was going to be good enough to make the amount of money to support my loved ones and, and, and friends and everyone that's kind of associated with what I had going on at the moment. Like I, I played pro soccer in Hong Kong when I was 18 and then I went back to Australia and, you know, I still wanted to give it a good crack. I mean, it was my dream. Like I've been playing the game since I was five years old, but you know, it's, it's a very competitive profession. Um, there's only so, so little, uh, there's not that many, uh, um, uh, uh, soccer players that actually become pro where they can they can become financially free from it and and i'm not sure what the numbers are but i know like one out of god knows how many actually makes it to the big leagues so i thought to myself okay i can keep trying and and then by the age of 30 I'll pro i'm probably going to break every bone in my body because i've already fractured every bone in my body by the age of 18 and then what if I haven't made enough money to live the rest of my life? Like I've got no education. I, I didn't make enough money in soccer. Then I've got to try and figure out what I'm going to do then. Right? So I thought to myself, you know, I'll bite the bullet. I'll hang up the boots now and let me choose a different path. So I, I hung up the boots when I was around 18 and a half, I believe or 19. And, you know, just went down the, the path of, of finding a job, right? No high school education. I can't read. I can't type, you know, my math skills suck. So thank God for the calculator. And, and worked as a laborer for three years and, and, you know, then figured out that once again, there's a bigger and better way to, to make money and started my real estate journey, mate. And look, I'm 31 years old now. I've unofficially retired two years ago and um, I, I, don't I don't regret it. I mean, I still have the kind of uh, within me, I feel like, man, it would be nice playing in front of 50,000 people and whatnot. I'm more, uh, I guess more now, I think that I want to actually own a soccer team <laughs> and, and, and watch, watch the game from the stands while the other guys are freezing their asses off on the field. So I've kind of changed a little bit when it comes to that. All right. That is the perfect segue. And that's exactly what I was kind of hoping is to get that glimpse of kind of what that looked like. And now with that in mind, we kind of brushed on the real estate part. Let's go back a little bit in time back to when you did start that real estate where you had to make that decision. Okay. Pro, pro soccer player, or I'm going to own a soccer team. You know, that was the, you know, hey, why not? You know, I could be just a soccer player or I could just do this real estate thing and then I'll own a team. So what were the first few deals in real estate and what were they like? Let's go back to that point. Let's talk a little bit about that, that journey, that experience. And, you know, it's always kind of a different story when we do this. It's, you know, sometimes it's super easy. What was your story? Like, how did that happen yeah. the first couple of deals? So, so Chris, I've, I've done so so many of them that I'm going to have to try and figure out the first few ones. But <laughs> no, look, to, to be honest with you, man, it was a shit show. Like, isn't anything a shit show when you first start? Absolutely. Like, I, I'd love to know any, any person that you've interviewed that said, I made a million bucks on my first three deals. Like, like seriously, I don't think it just happens. But um, like, I, I remember, I remember it was back home in Australia and I was living in Sydney and for whatever reason, I thought, you know what, let me just drive 12 hours to Victoria to this little piss pot country town <laughs> and start buying deals there because, you know, it, it kind of made sense to me at the time. So yeah, mate, I mean, those were my, those were my first um, two deals. I remember I bought them in a, in a little small town in um, Victoria um, and, and they weren't too profitable, to be honest with you. I actually did all of the work myself. I borrowed a lot of money. Um, and I kind of caught the bug of what a lot of folks were doing here in the US back in the, back in the day before the global financial crisis, right? Buying high, refinancing, pulling out the equity and trying to buy another one. And then, you know, you're losing more on the monthly mortgage repayments than the rent is actually bringing in. But you don't care because you think the market's going to go up forever. So that's kind of the perception of a lot of people in Australia, right? The market has been booming there for, for many, many years, even though right now there's been quite a bit of a pullback over the last year and a bit. So those are my first two deals, mate. You know, I, I bought high, did all of the renovation work myself, refinanced, pulled out the equity, went into another one. And I kind of did that 10 times. And, you know, it was all good and great. I was picking up a lot of chicks because I was like this real estate entrepreneur and real estate investor, Chris, you know, did the chicks love it at the club? But I was actually losing my ass every month um, because I wasn't covering the debt. But as I said, I quickly woke up and smelt the roses, so, sold out of that portfolio and, and moved to the US where, I mean, it's just, a, it's just such a cash flow haven when it comes to real estate. Um, but another cool little thing before I shut up here and, and, and let you take over, mate. Oh, keep on, going. This is good stuff. Yeah. Just on roll the, it, man. Just on roll. The, on the second property, mate, that I was renovating. So this is how crazily stupid I was, right? And when I put my mind to something, it's like, I don't sleep. I don't eat. Like, I just work, work, work until I succeed. And 
So I was, I was literally driving throughout the night to get to this property so, so I don't lose a day. And then I would work all day and into the night and I would do that for three or four days straight and then I would drive back. And on one of the drives back, um, this was on my second deal, I actually flipped my car at like 90 miles an hour on the freeway. So I, I don't even know how I'm alive to this day. You know, thank God I am. Um, but you know, it was, it was one of the, you know, after that accident, I thank God nothing really happened. Um, I got shaken up a lot, but I was a mess for around six months. Vertigo, nausea, vomiting, panic attacks, anxiety, depression. I mean, you name it. My brain was really, really rattled during the accident. So that was my second deal. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 90 miles an hour. There's not a lot of people that would survive that. No, that's, mate. No, mate. The car was the pancake. It was a miracle. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't really care who's, um, who's religious out there and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I, I believe in God, I believe in a higher power. And I, honestly, mate, if, if you saw the car and you saw me, like people were in disbelief how I walked out of it unscathed, like the roof was completely crushed in and I'm six foot three. Um, once again, I wish the camera was on so people could see how good looking I was. Well, I am sorry, not was I am. Um, but yeah, mate. once again, it was a miracle. So, wow. Unbelievable story right there. Now, in that story, you had mentioned you borrowed money, but who did you borrow money from? Was it from a bank? Like what your, those first couple of deals, where did you get the money to get started? Yeah. So financial institutions, I was getting really creative with using rental income um, to pump up my personal income. Um, and and um, yeah, I was only earning like 40, 40 grand a year. So back in the day, you know, there was creative strategies and I had over a million dollars in debt. So figure that one out for me. How can someone earning 40 grand get over a million dollars in debt? Once again, Similar shit to what people were doing here on the West Coast and East, East Coast during 2006 and earlier, right? So, yeah, mate, just from, from the um, banks in Australia. Yeah, so no, you, you just nailed it. I mean, that's exactly how that's possible. And that's exactly what landed us in the Great Recession in 2008, nine, you know, and, and beyond. That's, that's how we got there. But, uh, you know, you learned a lot from that. So now, today, you've got a lot more going on and you kind of brushed on it. I'm going to bring you back there in just a moment. But during this process of those first couple deals, the, the car crash, the rattle, and you know, your climb up to where you're at now and you know, being in the States, what have been some of your biggest external obstacles you've had to face with this? Well, mate, you put me on the spot. Biggest external obstacles. Um, you know what, mate? I think, I guess the, the biggest external obstacle was just moving to the U.S., that was tough. I mean, you know, I, I was in a long-term relationship, broke that off, um, uh, moved into the unknown. Like, yes, it's the same language, but it's really not. Like, you know, we, you guys say candy, we say lollies. You know, you guys say porch, we say veranda. You guys say, I don't even know how you call the bloody bonnet on the car and the boot. Anyway, that's how we say it, bonnet and boot, right? I don't even know what you guys say here, I forgot. But <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a, there's a difference in the terminology. There's difference in the way of life. Um, uh, I was here by myself, you know, there's no familiarity, no memories, no family, no friends. Like I was up shit Creek for a year and a half here. Then I had the various visa restrictions. I mean, US immigration, mate, they're tough. Oh, they're, they're nasty. They can Absolutely. be fucking wankers, mate. There you go. I dropped the F-bomb. and That's the okay. Too. Um, that's for your audience. They'll love that one. Wanker is a good word. Um, no, so it was, it was, it was tough, mate. Like, you know, I, I had to get a, um, I had to get a um, visa waiver, which was the tourist visa. Then I had to get a B1, B2 investor visa. Then I had to get an E2 investor visa. Then I had to get a green card. $57,000 later, four years later, you know, finally I'm a permanent resident. So that was tough, mate. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll go to the darkest moment. Um, grandma passed away. Mum got diagnosed with cancer, fracturing my left wrist, and I couldn't afford to fix it. Over a million dollars in debt, credit card debt, sour business relationships. And, you know, that was the lowest point of my life. And that was a year and a half into my U.S. journey, right? So, you know, I always said to myself, if I can overcome shit like that, dude, there's nothing that I can't do. And, and I think that desperate times call for desperate measures. So anyone listening that's on their knees right now, there's only one way and that's up. You can't, you can't go any lower, mate. So stick with it. Uh, I'll say this, Chris, nothing beats hard work. You know, I'm not the smartest guy out there. As I've already mentioned, I've got no formal education, no degrees, no real talents, but I'll tell you what, mate, I work from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day. No one can beat me in work ethic. And, you know, you work hard, you do the right thing and, and you know, the universe rewards you. You get to where you want to be, so. 
I love that. That's, that's actually very well said. And, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, every successful person that comes on this show and there's, you know, people just like yourself, like at the top of their game. And it's almost always the same journey. You know, almost everybody lands on their knees at one point or the other. And I almost have to draw a conclusion because I've done so many of these that every successful person has to fail before they can succeed. I think the more times you can fail, the more you're going to learn from those failures that will help you get to success fast. I think the people that don't succeed and the people that are still struggling to succeed are the ones that are too scared to fail because we're always dealing with that conventional wisdom, that conventional mindset that we're brought up with where you don't want to fail. Well, don't do this because that could fail. Damn it, fail. Like you have to fail in order to succeed. And you just said exactly that. You know, it brought you to your knees. And that was, heck, you were in another country kind of out of your realm and all this was just piled on you. And look at where you're at now. I mean, I just read some of your bio here. I mean, you own real estate all over the world, bought and renovated and sold over 500 properties. And this thing that you are now creating, we're going to have to get into that because I don't know what the heck that is, but it sounds pretty interesting. So I don't know if you want to take now and kind of talk a little bit about where you're at and like what this new big thing that you're launching is? Yeah. Yeah, mate. So just touching on, on the real estate. Um, yeah. So I did buy a lot of properties. Um, I'm not sure if I'm kind of happy about it or if I regret it because, you know, I kind of, when you, when you grow up with, with wants and, and desires and needs, and, and then you finally kind of get to a, a, a level in life where you've got enough capacity to go out and buy the dream car or two or three, <laughs> buy the dream property or two or three, what tends to happen, mate, is all of those things kind of start to consume your attention. Mm -hmm. um, and they start to take away from, from just your, your day to day, you know, and, and I guess why we start the journey of real estate and investing and flipping and wholesaling and whatever your audience is doing, it's to make a better life for you, to give you more time, to give you more freedom to spend with your loved ones, right? And the more shit that you consume, the more property that you buy. Like I've got three properties in the Bahamas. I've got a condo in Japan, in Croatia, I'm buying something in Australia. You know, it's like, why, why, why do you do all of that? And, I, and I'm actually thinking this to myself right now. Like I've just got to look after all of these assets. They're all sitting vacant. And I love what Warren Buffett said. Why would I have five cars when I can only have one? And like, well, I can only drive one at the same time, right? And that makes a lot of sense to me. So Something that I'm doing now is I'm consolidating all of all of my my purchases. I'm, I'm going down the minimal, minimalist path. I really want to be free from all of these materialistic um, items. And another thing too, mate, quality over quantity, right? When I started my journey as a real estate investor, I was just buying for quality based purposes. So once again, I could call myself an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and real estate investor. You don't need to do that. Be patient spend enough time conducting due diligence on, on, on the right deal and only pull the trigger when it makes sense for you, right? And it has to make sense from a cash flow standpoint so you can replace your current income that you might be getting from a nine to five job that you don't want to be working. So you don't have to own a hundred properties, right? You might own one multifamily unit um, and you consolidate everything into that one property. Anyway, that's just kind of my little tip, I guess, yeah. to everyone that, you know, there's no need to, to build a big portfolio and, 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 and have hundreds of houses. You can have a handful of properties, but a high quality type asset, right? Um, yeah, mate, look, so I've, I've got a lot of irons in the fire, Chris. Like I'm building a lot of things. I'm doing a lot of things. And, and that's another, another, um, uh, another one of my, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and, and I feel like I'm spread thin. And, you know, if you kind of look at the world as it lies today and one entrepreneur in particular, Elon Musk, he's copping a lot of shit for running, you know, Tesla and SpaceX and, and, you know, all of the other companies that he's running. So I kind of caught that bug too. You know, I've got a brokerage that we're launching. I've got a property management company. I've got a real estate investment company and all of these other, all of these other um, um, ventures uh, from a personal investment standpoint, you know, I'm actually looking at consolidating quite a few of those too. Um, but talking about, talking about list and sell realty. So look, mate, I'm very excited about list and sell realty because I see a shift in the, the, the real estate brokerage world. I'm finding a lot of real estate agents being very disgruntled with their brokers. Their brokers don't give them any value, right? They recruit you, but then you're on your own when it comes to leads, when it comes to training, when it comes to a lot of things. They supposedly give you a false perception of some kind of leads, but you never really get any leads, right? 
And I've seen a big market shift in what's been going on. 100% commission brokers are taking over, okay, period. I think that the, the traditional brokerage model with the commission split days is over. I don't think that's going to be around for much longer. I feel that the new wave of real estate brokerages is 100% commission brokers. And I feel that the brokerage that's going to take the biggest market share or the line market share and win is going to be the one that has the best tech. Okay. I see Keller Williams, Remax. Everyone is coming out of the woodworks now and saying, Hey, we're building tech. They're not really building tech. They don't have any software developers on staff. They're saying that they're building tech. It's all third party white labeled bullshit. Okay. It's not tech. Um, there are a few other brokerages out there. EXP Realty, which is pretty exciting. Um, they just, they're hundred percent commission broke. I don't like the multi-level marketing scheme that they have. I never really was a fan of that. Um, but once again, mate, I want to be a part of the change. I, I want to be, uh, you know, amongst it. I have put the project somewhat on hold right now. Um, it is time. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's time consuming. It's very expensive. Building tech is, does cost a lot of money. I do want to pick it up eventually. Um, but as of right now, mate, we're kind of, we're kind of on hold with it. Um, because, you know, as I said, you can only handle so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, and you know, this, it's exactly what you're saying. So many people, you know, we go a mile wide and we only go to go a foot deep. And really the, the secret sauce is you got to go a mile deep and a foot wide. And that's where the real success lies. And that's kind of what you just said. You know, you, you had all these things going on, but then you realize, wow, there's just, there's just not enough time to really focus on the thing. So with that being said, what would you say is your one true thing that you love? Like your one true passion with a purpose? Oh, dude, on the I know, spot. I'm diving. I'm on diving. Hey, man, hey, if you're going to sit there naked on this podcast, I'm going <laughs> to dive in, man. I'm just going to, I'm going to go right for it because, hey, why not just tell everybody what it is? What is that one thing you're really striving you're for? Putting me in an emotional, in an emotional spot here. So in all honesty, like in all honesty, mate, like I, I forgot what my purpose is. Like this is. It's a very honest answer because so yeah. did I. Yeah, so I, I forgot what my purpose is. Like, yeah, like I have been going so hard for so long and I'm talking 14, 15 hour days for the last five years where like I had a purpose and, and I'm like, what is it? And I've been searching for it for the last six months. Like, I don't know what it is. Like I've made all the money in the world, right? And I'm like, what is my purpose? And, and I'm looking for it, mate. I, I don't know what it is. I, I'm getting glimpses of um, philanthropy, helping people out, giving back but I'm still searching if, if that is actually what I want to be doing. And if it is, mate, I, I can't wait to, to actually, you know, say, yes, this is it because that's going to be my next thing. Like I'll give an example, mate. So I, I've gone down, you know how they say the destination, the journey is better than the destination. I hundred percent agree with that because I've reached my destination. And now what I'm searching for is a new journey without a destination. And I want that journey to be, uh, 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 joyful to bring me happiness and joy and fulfillment every single day. And I never want to reach a destination. So I don't know what it is, mate. I'm looking for it now. And that's kind of going to be my next thing. But that's my, I guess that's my answer for you. You know, I, I'm searching for that purpose. Well, it's unique because you're the first person that I've ever asked that question to and got that kind of an answer. And, and, you know, I never really kind of pull the curtain down on that one, but that's my, that's one thing that I've been struggling with. I do the same thing. I, I start work at six in the morning. I, I can tell you, there's barely a day that I get home before nine at night. And, you know, I've done a lot. I've, uh, you've done 500, we've done hundreds of different deals. I've, I've just got so much going on. I could pretty much buy any of the material things, but I don't want them. And yeah. I'm also where you are. I'm like, I'm looking at life. I'm looking at everything. And I'm saying, you know, what is this all about? What is my higher purpose? Yeah. And, you know, I'm just starting to figure it out. And that's this podcast, the Real Estate Money School is kind of that. It's my cool. give back is teaching people my life's journey with money and teaching people how money really works because nobody's going to teach you that. You know, you, so many people go through life with the conventional wisdom and conventional knowledge that they get and that they've been taught thus far, but they, they very rarely ever find the true secret. And really, you know, yeah, you've made a lot of money. A lot of people are struggling trying to just get ahead. And if they only knew, and what you mentioned Warren Buffett, he's my all time hero. He says, you know, if poor people, and I hate being cliche saying poor people, but he says, if poor people would just do what the rich people do. They wouldn't be poor anymore. And that goes with for everybody. It doesn't have to just be poor people. And that's why it's, I felt like it's my journey to go out there and teach people 
the real meaning of money and, and what money really is and how to really use money like the wealthy do. And it's kind of like what you were just saying. I'm still struggling trying to find it, but I think I found my path and you're there. You're the first person that's honestly had that much of a truthful answer. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. No, dude. And look, I've got nothing to hide. Like I always open with, I always play with an open, open deck of cards, mate. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm kind of searching for it, you know, and, and look, I can tell, you know, I know, I know this is the, the, the money podcast, mate, but I can tell you this, you know, for all those folks out there that are like, oh, I'm struggling, man. I wish I had a couple mil in the bank. I, I can tell you right now, it's great, but that's not it. That does not give you fulfillment. Like right. Tony Robbins said, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. hundred percent agree with that. I was watching a documentary too with, um, um, Andrew Carnegie. Um, uh, that's how you actually say it. Yeah. Carnegie. Yep. Carnegie. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, a, a, a man that dies wealthy is a man that dies disgraced. And, and I love that. And anyway, I don't know why I'm saying that. It's off topic, but it just- No, it's not. It's, it's about money. It's not yeah. off topic at all. And, you know, I love that too. And, and, and anyone, like another person, um, I can't remember what his name is. I do, Chuck Feeney. Um, he's called the James Bond of philanthropy. Like before anyone knew what he was doing, the guy like gave away $37 billion dollars. Um, and his number one condition was, you're not allowed to tell anyone what I'm doing and that I'm giving you this money. So these are kind of some folks that I look up to and, you know, they create this wealth and, and so much power and so much money, but then they all give it, give it all away. So maybe they get to a point in life where they're like, okay, I've made all of this money, but it's not really what it's, what I thought it was. And I'm kind of at that stage too. And I'm like, okay, I've made all of this money. And to be honest with you, it's not really what it, what I thought it was. So once again, man, I'm looking for what's next. I'm, I'm really leaning towards philanthropy. I, I, I think I think that's going to be it. And if it is, dude, I can't wait to give it all away. Honestly, I, I'm smiling right now because it's like shit. That sounds so cool. Just helping people in need. And I can tell you, I can tell you this, Chris. Over the 500 deals that I've done, I don't remember any of them, but you can ask me right now. How about the four houses that you gave away, dude? I'll never forget the smiles on those people people's faces. Like when I'm on my deathbed, that's what I'm going to think of, of of the people that we gave these houses away to. That's incredible. Um, but yeah, mate. Yeah. So that's, that's me. There you go. <laughs> that's, that is, that is you. And that is amazing on how you just explained that and whether or not it's a, you know, it's a direct fit for what we're talking about, but it really is because we're all searching for that, that higher thing that we want in life. And we always think it's money, right? It's money. It's the cars. It's all the things we see on Instagram and Facebook. That's what happiness is. Bullshit. You Bullshit. just nailed it. Bullshit. That is not what happiness is. That is what, Everybody wants you to believe that's what happiness is. And when you get there, you're going to realize how empty you are inside. Then you're going to dig really deep and figure out what your true happiness is. And real estate really, I mean, because this is the real estate money school, real estate is really just the, that's just the, we're just on the plane, on the train. The that's tool. Just the, it's the tool that gets us there. And it is the ultimate tool. It is the ultimate tool out of anything I've ever seen. And believe me, coming from the financial advisory world, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of ways and a lot of people that have made a lot of money and there is nothing like real estate. And the people that are watching this show, and you know, I'm going to have you address this in a moment, but the people watching this show, I just the biggest thing I hope they get out of this is understanding that to get started, it does begin with money and it really does end with money, but where that money goes and how it's you know used, that's the, the mystery. So the biggest thing I want everybody to take away is the, the understanding that real estate is the ultimate tool. And money is needed to make that tool work, but the money is all around you. There is no lack of money and there is no, no real difficulty in finding money for your deals. And I'm going to pass this over to you real quick. When you were building this and you did 500 deals, like how, how easy was it for you to find money for these deals before you had the money that you do now? Like how easy was it for you finding money for your deals? And what was the, I guess, what's one takeaway you could give to everybody in that? Yeah. So Chris, um, I do everything with cash. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I kind of went down the path of leverage, when I first started building my journey, um, uh, I just, I just thought that, you know, I want to be the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. If I start borrowing money from the banks, they've got me by the balls. If I start borrowing money from family or friends or hard money lenders, then I feel guilty if I lose it because I've got to pay it back. Right. And I just pretty much decided to go all cash. Um, you know, I worked as a laborer, I saved $50,000. And even though I made a lot of mistakes buying those first 10 properties and, and leveraging out of the ass, 
I, I was able to cash out and actually start my US journey with a little bit of capital. One deal snowballed into the other, into the third, into the fourth, into the fifth. Um, and, and once again, I just used my, used my own cash. Once I actually knew what I was doing and I was pretty sure that I couldn't lose, and even if I did lose, I had enough capital set aside to pay back uh, my hard money lenders. Then I started tapping into a bit of hard money, okay? Nowadays, I don't need it. I don't want it. I, I love closing on deals as quickly as possible. I can, people are throwing money at me now. Like it's ridiculous mm -hmm. to like the money that people want to give me. It's like unheard of. And I'm like, no, I don't want it. I don't need it. I like the slow and steady way, right? The stereotypical way that I would rather use my own cash and buy smaller deals and slowly grow it than go for the big one um, with, uh, with OPM or, or leverage, right? Um, summarizing what I'm saying here, mate, is, and, and I've said it before, nothing beats hard work. Okay. Nothing beats hard work. I, I see way too many investors looking for the easy way out. Uh, I'm going to leverage from the banks, um, low money down and no money down, whatever creative strategies there are out there. I don't believe in any of that bullshit, mate. I believe in working hard, two jobs if you have to, saving 50 to 100 grand in capital. Prove to yourself, dickhead, that you can save the money before you start your journey because Real estate is hard, man. It's hard work. Like mm -hmm. it's a roller coaster of a ride. And, and, you know, you want to have some kind of capital going into it. Um, and, and you want to prove to yourself that, that you can do it. So I, I, I would advise folks to save 50 to hundred grand of cash first before they start investing. That would be my, that would be my, 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 um, you know, two Australian cents for them. Um, but once again, to answer your question, the, the money is everywhere. Like, dude, it's, it's all around us. Like, I think they say that we cross seven big money-making opportunities every single day. Um, we just don't see them. Um, but, you know, proof, proof is in the pudding. Do deals with your own cash. Prove that you can do them. And before you know it, you're going to have people throwing money at your left, right, and center. That's awesome. That was perfectly said. Perfectly said. So as we get to the end of uh, the Real Estate Money Schools episode here, I, I guess everybody's going to be very motivated. This is Definitely different than what I thought it was going to be, but I love it. I love every oh, minute of this. You actually doubted me. I, I didn't know, man. Hey, in the beginning, well, actually, I didn't doubt. I just didn't know. And I learned in about, what, about the first 15 seconds how this thing was going to go. <laughs> the real estate went, dingo. Don't forget went, that name. <laughs> it went right there. I know. I know. The real estate dingo. I should have just known even before we even jumped on this thing. <laughs> So if everybody, you know, that's watching this and, and our audience wants to find you, what are the best places they can find you? Yeah. So, um, they can just Google Google's your best friend, right? Mm -hmm. So Angelo Remora, um, is my name. I don't even think we told the audience what my name is, but we didn't even better. Just Google the real estate dingo. You can't miss me. Um, so that's the way the easiest way to find me. And one of my companies, shameless plug here, Ohio cashflow.com or just Google Ohio cashflow. There you go. That's great. And you know what, what we'll do is when this thing goes to air and you know, becomes available for everybody to see, we're going to post that up just so that everybody can go to Ohio cash flow. And you know, like you said, just, just Google the real estate dingo. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of them. So pretty uh, easy to find. And I'll send a find. sexy picture of myself so you can post that up also. There you go. We'll put that actually, we're going to need that. So we'll post that up <laughs> and everybody will just want to watch it. Then when they'll watch, they'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been great. This has been awesome. So, all right, for everybody that's watching the Real Estate Money School right now, I just want you all to get started on your journey. It would mean so much that you take that leap. You have to take that leap to get going on your journey to being a rebel banker. And again, like I said, there's so many different paths you can go. If money's your struggle, grab a copy of the book, The Private Money Guide. Check out all of our great guests on this and especially the Real Estate Dingo and, and just kind of look at what everybody's done. Look at their journey and how they they've got to where they're at and just mimic that, follow that and understand that that journey is never straight up. It's going to be 
up, down, up, down. It's just not an easy journey. But with that being said, I hope you all walk away from this episode extremely motivated with some golden nuggets. And if you're young, try to keep the profanity down a little bit. This was not a PG rated episode and that's okay. So for that, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for the Real Estate Money School in this episode. And, and the Real Estate Dingo is just been so much fun. Thank you so much.